We're doing a session now with two wonderful uh, women who are joining me here um, uh, around intersectional leadership. Now, intersectionality is a term which uh, has been growing in the mainstream for years and has been available um, and spoken about for many years before that um, uh, within intersectional communities. And leadership is a word, of course, with a very, very long history. Um, and as we go through history, um, the majority of people who have been called leaders have been from certain communities and all, from uh, mainly men, um, particularly sitting here in the US um, and thinking about Europe, mainly white men, mainly white educated men, maybe white, white educated privileged men. And I wanted to get that out right at the beginning, <laughs> building up to it, um, because uh, a very uh, fantastic, wonderful, uh, white, educated, privileged man, who, uh, Albert Einstein, made the quote that you can't change a problem with the same uh, thinking that caused it. So can we change climate change with the same leadership that caused it? Or do we need to think really differently about the leadership which is going to be necessary right now and going forward? And in fact, do we even need to think about the word leader a little bit differently? Because there's a certain sort of top down, do what I say, not what I do, I'm I, you know, performative, I'm doing this uh, association with the word leadership. So actually, do we just need to get on and make the fucking change, depending on, uh, irrespective of who's making it? So um, I have got Mona Sinner, um, uh, who has, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, Mona, to introduce yourself, but who has recently uh, uh, hit the billion, was it the billion or the million? Billion. The billion, <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, raised funds for, um, uh, for women, and has spent all this week uh, talking on intersectional panels um, and discussing leadership and particularly uh, making very, very clear the intersectionality of climate and gender um, or even arguably the fact that they're the same thing. Um, and on my left, I have the, uh, the chief executive of the climate group who is to blame for all of this. In this extraordinary week that the climate group um, initiates, hosts, makes happen and holds space for us um, and who gets to sit on a lot of panels with a lot of leaders <laughs> yep. from the, around the world and not a small number of white men as well but also it has has the opportunity particularly with the business community but also with policymakers, to see how leadership is changing um, i've got a couple of questions but i'd also like to just actually have a chat and think about what, what we're going to say um, and being very aware that uh, we've got a lot of people watching who might be wondering about their own leadership as well. So as well as talking about the macro issues around leadership, the world needs, I'd also love to, us to talk about ourselves as leaders and our philosophy and how we can encourage more people to step, to step up. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go to my right first and ask Maya to introduce yourself and also talk a little bit about what you've been talking about on panels here at Climate Week. And then perhaps you could set the frame for us about uh, women and climate change and not just women as as we know are the primary victim of climate change but also women as the leaders of the change thank you for that solly what an exciting time to be here and what a week it's been <laughs> i mean climate week anger cgi i mean it's all rolled into this one week and then of course the rain comes in <laughs> so new york falls apart in rain it works for everything else um, I sit at the intersection of many different roles. I am an immigrant from India that moved to the United States in 1985. Um, I chair several different organizations, one of which, as Solly mentioned, is Women Moving Millions, which is a group of 350 women funders who fund gender equality at the rate of a million dollars. So we've just surpassed a billion dollars, which is very exciting. Um, <laughs> I also chair the work for the Equal Rights Amendment in the United States because this is the largest democracy and actually the only democracy in the world that does not include women in its constitution, which is a fact that not many people are aware of. And it's really the fundamental undergirding of, of the legal framework in this country, which um, you know, treats women as second class citizens. Um, I do a bunch of other things. I, I sit on boards. I'm a funder myself. Uh, and to answer your question about climate change and women's leadership, I think women are the solution seekers and the solution makers for the world's most intractable problems. And as we know, climate is the biggest 
elephant in the room and now kind of out there stomping around. Um, if you think about the very history of, of gender and gender leadership, it actually goes back to the Paleolithic ages, and I'm not going to start drawing the history out. I want to know that. But, <laughs> but the interesting thing, I did a little study on patriarchy because I was just interested in how we got here. And the reality is that um, in the very beginning of time, families and societies were largely matriarchal. It was the women who were the leaders who made the decision made, you know, about the families and about the communities and about the clans. Um, and then as climate injustices, as I like to call them, happened, you know, with floods and droughts and earthquakes, people had to move. And as they moved, they began to clash with other communities and clans. And the men took over because there was war. As you know, that's a male thing. And, um, and with that, women's leadership sort of started taking a, a, you know, a back seat. And you went from sort of agriculture and farming and sustainable living in very holistic terms to things that were not natural to the clan. And, and so that was the very, very, very beginning of, of how um, women shifted in their roles as leaders in the community. And if you look at the native community here in the United States, they're only 6.8% of the population, but they actually steward 80% of the biodiversity. So if you think about that, there is leadership unto itself. And women are not just impacted by climate change, but the reason I say that they are the solution makers and the solution seekers is because they're proximate to the problems. They are proximate to seeing the incidence of violence go up in the world when climate shifts happen and migratory movements are, um, are in place. If you look at the immigrant populations during war, they're mostly women and children. And women have to find the solutions to not just fend for themselves, but feed their children. Very basic, basic solutions. Um, and now we're seeing women really stepping into the funding network in a big way because the biggest gap here is resourcing. And if we resource this movement correctly and with the right brains behind it, and sitting on this panel for sure, um, I think that's where we will find the solutions. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for giving us that history lesson because uh, it, it really makes me think around the fact of, of course, we are likely going back into this period of climate instability, which of course puts so many of the hard-won uh, rights and, and equality that we've worked so hard for, both for women and also for LGBTQIA mm -hmm. and for um, uh, BIPOC, starts putting that perhaps under threat again. Now we're back in these instable times. Um, uh, Helen, so uh, CEO of the climate group, so I've just realised one of the things that we should have done as a gender is have like, slightly lower chairs. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't actually reach the floor. Tools of the patriarchy. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so over the, over the years of uh, running Climate Week, um, have you seen a change in how leadership is turning up? Um, who is taking leadership? Or is it same old, same old? Yeah, so to some extent, so Climate Week, I guess, has been going for, I think this is 14th, I mm -hmm. this is my 6th, um, and, you know, we have a mixture of things. We have something called the opening ceremony on the first day, and actually, I used to come as a participant um, years ago, and I actually, before I joined Climate Group, no one had, no one had heard of me there, and so they Googled me, and they found... Um, uh, a Twitter, I don't really actually post that much on Twitter, but I, I'd written, an, like, what I, so it wasn't hard to go back a few years and find a Twitter thing where I'd sat in the audience at Climate Week, not knowing that six years on I'd, I'd apply for the job, and I'd taken a picture of an all-male <laughs> panel, and I'd written, I think it was one of my best tweets ever, it was like, another all-male panel at Climate Week, but I guess you broke it, you fix it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> thank you. But yeah, I had like 10 followers, so it didn't quite get there, yeah. so that's nice to get it now. Um, and so my, like, the team had seen this, and I arrived, and everyone was like, <laughs> <laughs> she used to be rude about us. So yeah, it's something we have quite deliberately gone after. I mean, at that opening ceremony, we want world leaders there. We want yeah. CEOs there. We want decision makers. Yeah. And an awful lot of those come to us and are men. And then you're like, well, we need those people there because that's what that particular event is around. But how do we get a diversity of voices? Yeah. And so we work really, really hard at our programming. And we have yeah. quite a lot of rules for ourselves with events about how we want to show up with diversity. Mm -hmm. We haven't hit all our goals um, this year, I don't think. Um, particularly actually, the opening ceremony, we got a, a certain other massive world event that happened that day, and we lost some uh, lost yeah. some speakers, uh, including some diversity there. But um, but what we want to do is not, but not be kind of tokenistic about yeah. it. And I think that's the critical thing because we do want to hear from those people who are making decisions, 
And I think it's really easy when, you know, a very kind of prestigious woman of colour says, actually, I'm going to go and speak at this other thing and turns it down yeah. to be kind of cross with them because they've ruined your diversity. And it's not that. It's, yeah. it's not their fault that there aren't enough people like that in the world and that they're being pulled in all sorts of different yeah. directions. So I think we... Do we find we have to really challenge ourselves? We want to hear lots of different voices. We really want to balance things across the hub and across the opening ceremony, make sure we're hearing from different people. And I think if you look across the whole week, you really get that. Yeah. Um, but I don't want anyone to feel that they're they're there sort of there's a woman's seat, you know, or a person of colour seat that that they had to fill. They're there because they're the right speakers. And so and so it's starting with the topics and the conversations we want to have and then thinking about who, who might come and talk about that. Brilliant. I, I had, um, in terms of the woman's seat, I once got contacted through LinkedIn three days before an event um, with someone saying, and we would really love you to come and speak at this event. So it's a little bit um, uh, late notice, but we realised we didn't have a female perspective. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was on like hardcore ESG issues. And I'm like, I wonder what my secondary sexual characteristics have to say <laughs> about, about corporate social responsibility reporting. But I um, think it's really yeah. important we will turn those down. I turn those yeah. down. I, yeah. Anything where yeah. I feel like I'm there because I'm a woman. That's tokenism. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's nothing but talking not really They really wanted to hear your voice. They would have they would started me, with that. They must be three <laughs> so, weeks ago. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. Yeah, three weeks or three months ago. Um, uh, so one of the things which um, I notice in this movement, and having been in this movement now for my entire adult life, sort of, uh, you know, uh, well more than two decades, is that actually a lot of the people doing the work on climate change be it the CSOs and the, the heads of sustainability inside businesses, be it in community groups and community leadership around the world, particularly in the youth climate movement, um, is a lot of women. Mm. Um, uh, the, the youth climate movement being particularly notable um, uh, about that. And yet still some of the platforms, etc., of course, are not necessarily the people who work on, on climate change. They seem to tend to be the, the leaders that you're doing in, um, uh, from elsewhere. And so we really do have a, 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 a much more women's led movement on climate action than perhaps other movements uh, have been historically. Um, how can we uplift that? Because the, the, we've got so many, the terminology that I use, solutionist, we've got so many extraordinary, wonderful uh, solutionists and also solutionists who are intersectional with other issues. I'm thinking of uh, Leah Thomas, the inter intersectional um, environmentalist, Shia Bastida. We've got so many of these wonderful voices that, that are coming up. What can we do to, to bring up that leadership much more? Uh, and particularly, uh, I'm not sure, the, the word empower always tends tend to imply giving a little bit of a power mm. away. Mm. But actually perhaps power transfer would be the better word. I mean power transfer to these amazing uh, leaders who would perhaps different to some of the leaders who have caused the problem like obviously you're doing that with funding and we're right. actually making sure that there's there's money going to those to those women well you know the reality is we don't have to give it to them they're going to take it anyway ah. that's the generation um, this generation the next generation feels very strongly about the burden that they are inheriting and frankly, they don't want to be the only solution makers or solution finders because they want to learn from those of us that have been before them and frankly, the ones you know, before us who created some of the problems. So I think it's, it's uh, in that context, it's intersectional in that it should be intergenerational. So it shouldn't also be just about the people who've created the problem, it should also be the people who've dealt with the problem and coming together to find those solutions. Um, I really believe that the best leadership is collaborative leadership. And so you have to have conversations with people that you disagree with, or you, because you're not going to understand what you're up against if you don't have those conversations. So how are you going to find the best solutions and just have someone block you because you haven't you know, just been graceful enough to ask their point of view? Yeah. So I do think that um, it's happening. We see it all around us. The only way we're going to be able to combat it is for everybody to come together. And that's a big ask. But, and I think particularly, not to gender it, but I think women are more collaborative in general. We like being in community. We like talking to each other. We like listening to stories. And um, I hope that that's the secret sauce that helps bring change. I think that's a great secret sauce. And we're going to come back a little bit um, in a minute to how the people watching can start um, activating some of this in their own leadership. 
Um, in the climate group and the, and the work that you're doing, you have uh, uh, platformed new voices mm -hmm. and people people who are, who are coming through. Like, how easy is that, or is there always a sort of trade off between sort of uh, should we say the old forms of leadership and the new forms of leadership? I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be clear. We don't have like a spreadsheet with like you know <laughs> women because that's bad, yeah. right? You've got to yeah. start with the yeah. solutions themselves, yeah. and so I think then if there are good solutions, those yeah. those will rise. And it's just sort of coming at that with kind of a, a more of an open frame of mind, maybe, and, just, and, and being sort of careful about it. And to your point about kind of secondary sexual cultures, I'm always like, you know, there's a strain of kind of environmentalism, which is like, oh, somehow, because you've got a womb, you're going to be like at one with the earth. I hate all of that no, stuff. Yeah, so yeah. anything like that, I sort of shy away from. But I think there is a kind of socialization that you're talking about, particularly yeah. of kind of our generation. I'm really interested to know whether the young the young, the youth, the younger people who are maybe socialised a bit differently, that d does them become a different thing and it's not quite that difference and, and maybe men are socialised in a yes. more kind of feminine mm -hmm. way and that might bring change. For me, I'm just very pragmatic. We've got a really small amount of time. Yeah. And so just sort of, if you kind of keep pushing that, you know, our messages are all about like justice, urgency, accountability. Yeah. I think, I hope that you'll get the, the cream to rise and you'll yeah. get into the thing. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about what how we've looked at the. Can I talk about how we've looked at the sector and seen how? Please. Yeah. So, we we had this issue a few years ago. We were looking at the diversity of our own staff and kind of going, oh god, we're just you know such a white office when we looked around it in London. Um, and so then we started to think about why might that be, and actually watched a really influential. There was a BBC documentary about class and employment, mm -hmm. and it was a really interesting kind of lens in. And one of the kind of moments that we had of realization was we take people in typically in their second or third jobs mm -hmm. and therefore someone else out there has kind of filtered them whether that's the civil service or you know the big four accountancy firms or something yeah. else. so someone out there is filtering and then we're like astonished when everyone who applies it um, looks the same as each other and so we were then thinking well how do we get in so obviously we did well not obviously but a few years ago like many others were like right Unpaid internships gone. Yeah. Always a fun conversation with your board. They're like, just send my, just once my niece has done. Anyway, no. but um, <laughs> yeah. you know, so get rid of that. Yeah. And then we started partnering with an organisation that were really thinking. They'd been thinking about diversity in the entertainment industry and saying, okay, well, how do you apply that now? Let's apply it to the NGO sector. And then um, signed up with something um, at Charity Works, which is. Um, they call themselves the grad scheme for the charity sector. And it's brilliant. It's like those grad schemes that people might have pulled into the big, you know, fast-moving consumer good companies or, like, yeah. you know, accounts or whatever, but actually looking at the, the, the sector as a whole. And we've just had some brilliant graduates from that. And so we were thinking, like, how do we become part of the solution with the pipeline of people? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I sort of I wanted to talk about it because I really would just love everyone to join those things yeah. and think about it's not going to... They aren't going to be the people who are leaders probably that top CEO level by 2030, but you know, this is a really, <laughs> they might actually, but they're, they're, this is a really, really long term kind of yeah. fight. And so I think us all thinking about not being too passive about who's coming through and how we play our role. That's my little, my little uh, soapbox. 100% <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, com completely agree. And also, um, one of the things which we've been thinking about is how can we go and steal for, uh, from other industries mm. where actually there's fantastic people um, with intersectional views who are doing incredible work um, and have got a different perspective than the climate movement, which worldwide the climate movement is incredibly diverse. And in fact, if you go to a COP, um, there is, mm. of course, the whole world is represented there. And actually, although we often talk about in Europe and North America, the climate movement um, not being very intersectional globally, it truly is. Uh, yeah. you know, on a global, unquestionably. And so one of the things which we've been thinking about again is how can we look at other industries and actually steal uh, uh, and pull people into the climate movement um, who have got perspectives different to what is, uh, what's there. And also how can, how, how can we steal from other countries? Which sounds <laughs> terrible coming from yeah. a British accent. But how can we bring in and make sure that this is more global in terms yeah. of the perspective of people who are working in this issue? Which again, 30 years ago, that was a difficult sell because particularly people working on other issues um, uh, were like, well, why do I, well, I'm never going to go and work with climate. It's like I'm doing on, incredible on the ground work here. But then as Mona says, it's becoming clear now that, that climate and gender, climate and uh, access, climate and poverty are the same problem. And so actually it is appropriate for, for us to 
pull people in from, 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 from other movements and to try to connect all of this up mm. and collaborate. One thing, though, I'd like to see is how at the COP, because you're right, this COP is incredibly diverse, and I don't, not everyone will have been to it, but you know, you've got thousands of people there from all over the world. But it occurred to me last year, I was wondering, I was like, my COP is completely different from, like, you know, some bloke from Benin or something that's yeah. having like a completely different experience. We're moving around each other in this yeah. space. And I wonder how that, what we could do better on, you've got all these people in one place, but I probably see, I mean, 40% of people I talk to are, I probably talk to in London. You yeah. know? And so it's like, I think we need to get really creative about, and I, I don't have an answer on this. It just sort of occurred to me last, last year as I was running around, I was thinking, we're just having a completely different experience of this. We need to figure out how to... But Helen, you're something. doing that right now in Climate Week. It's like we literally... Climate Week is doing it's that. It's true. Having different but, conversations. Yeah, but how do you get that... I mean, we always... get to call. Yeah, yeah, but also in things like, you know, I spend my time at Climate Week doing this kind of same... Well, because we're running it. But my team was like, yeah, I'm definitely this year. I'm definitely this year going to go to an event on it. And then you see them on Thursday and they're just like, oh, I can't. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. other people are having that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there is the opportunity of storytelling, the importance yeah. of storytelling. And, you know, it's so rich to have all this diversity in a place and really a shame not to be able to engaging, uh, engage in it. So there must be a way to sort of digitize it, put it out there, even if it's not in person. It, you know, I mean, look at what we're doing now, right? Everything is is digital and can be seen from anywhere in the world, it also allows you to expand what you're learning there because everyone's not going to be at COP, right? And it is the reality of our lives now. We cannot deny it anymore. Mm. It is a part of every movement as it has to be. And so we just benefit from the lived experiences of people on the ground. So I think if that's your work, Solly. <laughs> if, there's, okay. if, there's a, if there's a way of yeah. capturing those stories and putting them out into the world, I think that's a, a wonderful way yeah. of you know, having those stories heard, having those people be seen. Um, and then bringing it into other spaces. You know, at Little Moving Millions, we have an annual summit yeah. where we really talk about uh, funding opportunities and we put out leaders. This year, we focused on democracy. And maybe the next one needs to focus on climate because those are not intrinsically different mm, things. Yeah. So uh, putting them on stages where it's not normally seen, but um, it's just going to be part of our lives now for the next. Se and we have seven years. You're right. We, we don't have years. a lot of time. So if seven years is urgent and just bringing that message through. The other thing I will say is for those of you who are so steeped in climate, you know, you use the jargon, you use the language, mm. and you don't realize what it really means to other people. So this 1.5 number was being thrown around for the longest time. I'm like, am I the only one who doesn't know what this 1.5 is, you know, till you start reading about it and understanding because it's just not so simple. There's many layers to that. And we were just on a trip um, to Greenland where we saw firsthand what that 1.5 actually meant. So I think those experiential um, things are very important as well. When you see something, you can't unsee it. Mm. And that stays in your brain, and it makes it much more real than reading something on a piece of paper. Well, thank you so much for bringing that up. And actually, it's just making my brain explode of how many shortcuts we use in this, when the whole point of these of Climate Week is to draw more people in and to open it up and to get a big conversation going. And then we just use things such as one point, and just say 1.5. Like as in, as if it's just like 1.5, it's just like these numbers and everyone should know what that means, why it's important. And I was thinking about, um, I don't know, I won't name names, but when I did a uh, workshop with uh, a, a, a board, um, almost all of whom uh, were men, and I call it sort of sex ed for climate change. Ask, it, <laughs> ask any question you've ever wanted to ask, but were too afraid to ask your CSO. And somebody asked me what 1.5 meant. And I explained the fact that that is the amount of global warming that we're trying to keep ourselves within because although it will have many negative effects, it is much safer than two or what have you. And he was horrified. He said, what? Like, we're accepting that amount of climate change. Like, literally things getting that bad is the best. Mm -hmm. And realising the fact that actually, because we don't explain as well as we should some of these topics... That, that some people think that, you know, that the, 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 the bad is good and the good is bad and not realising actually how serious and urgent this is. Yeah. I'm just going to flip us um, because so many people watching this, so many people, the people here, um, are themselves leaders, uh, might not know it, <laughs> but actually are already leaders. 
So, and, and a sitting, seeing us sitting here on a panel at Climate Week being videoed, um, I'm wondering, how can I get there? Do I want to get there? How do I lead? Um, I'm too scared. It's too challenging. I'm too embarrassed. What if I get pushed back? So I'd like to talk a little bit about you and about you as people and about your own leadership and your own philosophy and what you find difficult. Because I think what we can do is perhaps be a little bit more honest about what it's like being a leader, about what's difficult about it, um, uh, about the fact that I was uh, I, I wore a very nice dress earlier this week um, and I forgot I didn't have any pockets. And so during uh, the day, I had about four different people clipping microphones onto my bra strap um, because it, and just being embarrassing and distracting and not being able to think. So just sort of... Um, uh, that's not my philosophy of leadership, by the way. I do have a yeah. philosophy of leadership, and it's not strap it, strap um, packs to your to bra But I mean, what's your philosophy of leadership? What kind of leader are you as a person? And do you know why you're that kind of leader? What made you the leader that you are? That's an interesting question. I really believe that as humans, we are linked. I don't believe in the ranking system. Um, and I really reject that. I think leadership needs to be recognized, but there are different ways of recognizing it. Um, I think the biggest trait of any leader is to be just a huge listener. You have to listen to what you're hearing around you. You have to listen to opposing viewpoints. And quite frankly, it's quite interesting. You know, when I'm not that I'm always sitting with someone who's a MAGA believer or something, but when I do, I'm quite fascinated by where that thought of you know, leadership or that thinking comes from. And what you realize is the people that you think you're fighting with actually approach an issue with the same passion that you have for yours. And that was kind of an aha moment to me because I'm like, oh, they're all bad, they're all terrible. That's kind of what we tend to say. But when you dig deep, you realize that it comes from a place of great conviction. So you can't really change someone radically until you understand where that comes from. I will say that I love leading in community. Um, I like being in spaces like this, in rooms where we can have open conversations and learn from each other. I'll give you an example. At the ERA Coalition, we have 288 organizations that fight for equality. And one of them is a group of high school students called Generation Ratify. And they are strident. I mean, they're the first ones to show up at any march. They're you know, out there with their banners and so forth. And every time we circulate something, it's a petition or it's a lawsuit or whatever it is, they send it back to us. And they're like, we're not going to sign this because you forgot to say this, that, and the other. And it's just amazing because that perspective is so important. And also their philosophy is we can't do this alone. We don't want you to people older than us to tell us that this is our fight to fight on the climate or on the justice front. Um, we have to do this together because just because we've inherited it doesn't mean we're going to solve it. And you know that's great. So I think just being a radical listener um, and as a leader just coming from a place of abundance, of assuming goodness and assuming that there's plenty so that when people come from a place of scarcity, they tend to be much more feisty and protective you know, of, of what they own. Um, so I would offer those three things up, really listening, you know, community and abundance. And Mona, uh, I love that, listening community and abundance, and abundance particularly being something which tends to not be the language we talk in this area. What's your biggest challenge? What do you struggle with the most as a leader when you're doing all of these platforms and you've got such a strong voice? Like, what do you find hard? I think I, I find it hard to be, um, frankly, empathetic with people who are very strident. Because I feel like if I am giving you the respect to listen to your point of view, I would like you to give me the respect to listen to my point of view. And that doesn't always happen. Um, so, you know, it, I find that I kind of feel the hackles rising, you know, when, when someone is attacking you. And that happens all the time. I've been attacked on Twitter. I've been attacked on many platforms. And, um, and I do find that difficult. But I think you kind of have to say, recognize that that is a narrative that people believe in and, um, and work yourself out of it. So, you know, I have lots of deep breathing techniques and all of that stuff that, you know, we all do as women. Um, and really being able to engage that. But I get so much positivity from other people that somehow that, you know, negates it a little bit. Yeah. But thank you. And thank you for the vulnerability of sharing what it is that you struggle with. 
Um, Helen, what's your philosophy of leadership and what do you struggle with the most? Well, I don't think I have one, but then I was thinking, and I was like, that's great. I should write that down. That one. So this is yeah. that. I think what I think in general is I start with my basic premise is that most people are good. Yeah. So that's yeah. a good place to start. Yeah. You, know, you can get dis- disproved sometimes, but like yeah. that starting point. But also a view that kind of um, was it like the rising all boats on the rising tide, something yeah. like that. But like, there's not a. I've got these very muddled metaphors. I remember years ago, sort of saying at work, there's not like this limited pie of glory, and that like right. if I take a bit, you can't have it. I yeah. think that's your abundance yes. thing, right? But actually, if we all kind of collaborate and can and, and do well together, we'll all do better. Yeah. And so try and not do the individual credit thing and um, try and make sure that, every, yes, you're rec- I think recognition is really important. And yeah. I do find that quite hard sometimes with like, am I, you know, if you, I sometimes think, oh, if I keep going on about the recognition, then it kind of does that devalue it. And I, sometimes it um, probably doesn't actually, and should do yeah. more of it. But I always wanted to be sincere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that kind of, someone once said, like specific actionable praise. And I was thinking, oh, that's a good, Good yeah. phrase. So for me, it's not like a philosophy. It's just little bits of mantras, but but generally a view that as a as a team, if we can all do well and not all lift up, and yeah. it's not about one person versus the other. I I mean, I definitely I the imposter syndrome is real, and then I sometimes think that that's the I don't know if it's the secret sauce, but you sort of like the, oh the confidence of a middle aged white guy. I, mean, I just you sort of look at it and think I don't know why you can stand there and. Like, are you deep inside going, maybe they'll notice me? You know, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know. So that I do still struggle with that, that feeling. Particularly uh, the Monday of Climate Week, and I have to do this big opening yeah. thing, and, I'm, and I, I'm sort of standing backstage going, oh, God, everyone's going to be looking at me and thinking, yeah. what's, she, what's she on about, you know? But and once I've done that, the whole of the rest of the week is it's fine. Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> exhausting, but great. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I've done is, I'm not, I don't think I'm a diva, but... And I joke about my ride there, but my thing is like, I'm not going to walk upstairs to get yeah. onto a stage. Mm. So I yeah. have to be like, yeah. so like, yes, you can make this big entrance and we'll have a light. I'm like, no way. I'm going to be standing <laughs> on the edge of the stage and then shuffle gently into place. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing, I don't, I cannot talk from behind a podium. I can't do it. And I yeah. don't, so I'd much rather be in the middle mm. of the stage. Yeah. People think, oh, that's brave. And it's like, for me, as soon as I'm behind the podium, I just want to like crawl yeah. behind it. And so I think, it's work, I think some of it is just working those things out about yourself. And like, yeah. I don't know why when my podium fears come from, but no. I, I know where mine is. I'm five foot five. They usually are there. And then so you do this thing, you're like, <laughs> bring the mic down. Yeah. And there's exactly. a whistle. And you're like, yeah. oh, God, Paul, well, he was really tall. <laughs> and then, you know, you're just off to a bad stuff. Honestly, I think that that image of bringing the mic down is such a metaphor for leadership change. <laughs> Pass the mic. No, just bring it down. Yeah, no, um, so. You, you were going to jump in there, Mona. So I was going to say, you know, it was interesting because when I stepped into a leadership of this group, which was largely white women, certainly didn't look like me, it was uncomfortable. And there was this whole struggle I was having with, am I not humble if I'm visible? Because it's a very visible role, right? We're talking about millions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. People want to know about it. And I was really struggling with it and because we were always taught as, as young girls and women, oh, you just, you know, be quiet, like you do well in school, but don't brag about it, you know, this whole thing. Until someone told me, because I worked with Mother Teresa when I was a child, I grew up in Calcutta, and greatly admired what she did. And someone said to me, okay, you're a big admirer of Mother Teresa. Do you think she wasn't humble and visible? And that changed the whole paradigm for me. I was like, oh my God, of course she was, you know, of course. So it's not that you're visible for yourself. You're actually visible for whatever cause you're fighting. And that paradigm shift really gave me a lot more confidence to go out there and do it. Yeah. I, I like reading stories of, of famous people who have stage fright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that gives me, I'm like, oh, that's yeah. not just me. Yeah. So I, um, I so, so, so resonate with this. Um, uh, I once made a speech, I was asked to speak at MIT, and I was only about 28, and I was really, really, really nervous. Um, and I'd done so much work on it, and I planned it, and I'd got my slides, which will shock anyone who works with me now, because <laughs> I never plan my presentations. Um, and I walked up on stage um, to introduce myself, and I couldn't remember my own name. <laughs> I was standing there going, I know the whole rest of my speech. But, and then I, I, I looked and my name was on the slide. And I just had that minute of going, solitaire, that's weird. Is that right? Okay, yes, yes, that's my name. But of course, to anybody watching, I would have come across as this incredibly confident 28-year-old making this speech to MIT. And so I think for me, one of the, the big learnings I have is that confidence is a complete con. 
-hmm. Nobody feels confident. Confidence is not an emotion, it's a skill. Mm -hmm. You can learn to act confidently, mm -hmm. you can learn to present confidently, you can learn to write confidently, you can even learn confident decision making and confident networking. But even whilst you're doing all of those things confidently, you still might feel like, ah, inside. And I think perhaps, perhaps this feels like a revelation to me and perhaps that is what the confident white men know is that <laughs> you've just got to basically style it out. Um, I think there's so many, particularly women, waiting to feel confident mm. enough to do the thing. Right. I've got to feel confident before I make that step. If I, you know, if I felt confident, I could do this. And so they wait and wait and wait for that confidence to build without realizing that, no, that's not the way around it works. Like throw up, and go and make the speech. Like, like, like literally let <laughs> Just not on stage. Yeah, not on stage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Let your knee shake underneath whilst, whilst you're asking for the thing. Write the document and send it through and just use your first initial. Like, do the things with the imposter syndrome. Um, and then maybe one day when we're all 90, we'll wake up and actually feel confident. Mm. But that for me was this massive revelation of going, if I keep waiting to feel confident, I'm never going to do anything because the imposter syndrome is still, yeah. is still there. And I just wish, particularly more women, and um, particularly young women, realize that but you just got to go out and do it mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be terrifying forever and the better you get at it the more amazing platforms you get and you get to you know introduce world leaders and be on platforms and so it's just going to get scarier and scarier and scarier <laughs> Yeah, and then be able to tell a good anecdote. I once, yeah. so Governor Gavin Newsom yeah. walked onto stage at Climate Week, and I, if you haven't seen him, he's quite a kind of holly, he looks like he's just been chiseled from kind of California stone. <laughs> yeah. And he walked on stage, and I basically did a dosey do around him, and my team still laughed, but like, I, I was kind of going, oh, and then like, took following, and then oh, followed him around. And <laughs> I, then, yeah. I did this kind of loop of Gov yeah. Governor Newsom, and then took, <laughs> still say, so I think being able to laugh about that stuff, yeah. I think. Yeah. If I wasn't telling everyone, no, everyone, this is... Uh, but maybe hey, it's on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> okay, it's idiot, hey, you, you remembered your name. <laughs> but it's, and I think perhaps being, um, when we're talking about leadership for, for climate change, being abundant, being collaborative, being honest and authentic, helping to bring up other people, and also just being like much more honest. Yeah. And vulnerable. And vulnerable yeah. about the fact that um, I often talk about the glass ceiling and going, I, 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 I'm sorry, the climate change is above the glass ceiling. I don't have time for the glass mm -hmm. ceiling. I've got a much bigger monster to fight up there. And so this sense of going, the world needs you to do the things and give the gifts and make the change that you're able to make. Um, even if it's embarrassing and fearful and you're worried you're being egotistical or you're being visible and humble. Um, and I think both of you are such great examples of that. I'm just going to close by saying, um, how can the traditional leaders help with this? So we've talked about um, women's leadership, intersectional leadership, more diverse leadership, more global leadership. But of course, mm. as Helen opened with, the leaders which we currently have statistically still wait towards certain demographics. And if we have seven years um, to do this, if we know that there are so many great ideas and solutions coming from non-traditional leadership, how can those old white men help lift up? So how can those who are, who are currently holding the power help to spread it and bring others up? Because I think we spend a lot of time uh, uh, set, pointing out the problem and perhaps less time actually making an ask of them of what they should do. So what, what, what could a very senior, uh, traditional, old white man leader do no, to help lift up new leaders? Well, I think, I think maybe, it's so boring saying like this, but I think where with companies that we work with, actually setting those just setting those internal targets and mm -hmm. they hate it and i've seen i've seen these horrible conversations of diversity where people go but we've still got to hire the best person and that just jumps into an assumption why wouldn't the best person not look like you exactly. so there's yeah. weird things like yeah. of course you're going to hire but you've got to and i think that very kind of deliberate programming of stuff and sort of actually just putting the change i think there's a lot of um sort of psychology out that i've sort of read around um People think that actions follow beliefs, and often it's the other way around, and belief mm -hmm. follows action. So yeah. if you can get people doing the right thing, whether that's on diversity or on the climate, 
they then become people who believe that they're, they're good climate people or, or yeah. understand diversity. And so I think we just mustn't be afraid of like getting in there and kind of giving very practical ways, which is often around that kind of measurement and management stuff, which is not as maybe as inspiring as something, but it can then lead to, oh, look, look how great our workforce is diverse. You might start from a point of pride, oh, we've diversified a bit, and look at all look at the women we've got on the board. And then you realize that the company is better run. And show, uh, you know, yeah. there's a lot of data coming out now that um, companies that have good climate goals, have good diversity goals, all those things, actually perform better mm -hmm. than the rest of the market. And it's not because necessarily women are taking better decisions on the board. It's more but that they are. Yeah. <laughs> they are. But it's that diversity of thinking that makes yeah. the whole team operate better and yeah. makes the lift lifts yeah. it up. And I think that when people start to see the results from what diversity does, and just having lots of views around the table, not just one type of view, yeah. that can then see the results. And like, how do we do it? And actually, get, have to get quite programmatic about it, I think. Brilliant. So actually programming it in um, and setting it from the top. Yeah. Mona. But I also think, you know, corporate America is very siloed in their approach, right? You're, you're evaluated on one particular thing. How will you do that? And that's great. And move on to the next mm. one. We aren't siloed people. Right? We have multiple interests, we have multiple, this is what intersectionality means, is that our lives are multidimensional. So I think for leadership, they need to recognize that multiplicity of what they have, which is a treasure trove, right, within their own companies, if they only just ask the questions. Yeah. What do you believe in? What do you think this would do? Mm. What do your kids say to you around the dinner table? These are the things you just get to know each other, not just as humans, but you're actually building solutions that are built into your everyday life. And it's not just, especially after COVID, we've seen, right? It's not just work is work and then home life is home life and you know your dog's barking in the background is unacceptable. It's all okay now. Mm. So I think it's a unique opportunity for us to actually understand better who are these people who we are interacting with every day. And I'm not just looking at, you know, Mike as a salesperson but I'm looking at Mike who has solar panels in his home. Mm. Or, you know, that kind of thing. I would never know that if I didn't have a conversation on a different level. So I really think the solutions are there. It's just a matter of us trying to find them. Find them and bring them together. And um, I've been so pleased that so many of the speakers here at Solutions House um, have sent their wider for coming to Solutions House, which has been, I'll only speak on a diverse panel. Um, and not because of the optics, but because otherwise it will be boring. Mm. And mm. I thought that was that was such a great quote that I got from someone who said, no, I'll only speak on a diverse panel because otherwise it will be boring. And I just thought that's that's such an understanding. Um, again, for, this was from, from a, a, a white man speak, speaker of, of going, but you know, I want people to watch this panel and to share this panel. And if it's if uh, you know, that's actually quite an ego thing. I want my the panel that I speak on to be successful. And if it's not diverse, it won't be a successful panel. So I just thought that was mm. that was again something um, uh, something that people can do to help um, open that up. Well, the other thing I do often is um, I strictly believe in governance practices of when you're in leadership, there's a time for you to step off. Yeah. And there are some people who just want to be in the same position for 20 years. That's just not good business, right? Yeah. And when I step off, I always ask, well, who are you replacing me with? And they're like, oh, we have a list. And I'm like, no, 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 who are you replacing me with? Someone who looks like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting to see how things have shifted on some of the big boards I've been on, mm. where you really make a pitch to say, I, I value what I bring to this board, and I want that same thread of opinion to be on this. And we can all do that. I love we that. We can all do that. That's so, and I wonder how many CEOs are thinking about you know, who comes next. I absolutely love it. Um, uh, I'm going to say thank you so very much to you. I'm going to say thank, thank you. you so very much to Helen. Thank you so very much to Mona. Um, one of the joys of Solutions House is getting to have panels with people I just want to hang out with. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this has been thank absolute you. one of them. Um, and uh, I would just leave with the encouragement of the fact that um, leadership is not a scary word. And that when it comes to climate change, we need 7.5 billion people who are actually deciding to take leadership in their own lives and their communities for that. And that will automatically make this a diverse and slightly different world than the ones that we currently live in. So thank you so, so very much. Please join me in thanking our wonderful staff.